Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this final session on of part one of ReFestival. Um, it's a great honour for, for me to uh, introduce Roman Gnarik. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to be a good ancestor. Uh, Roman is uh, an author and a public philosopher, and he's written about many uh, broad-ranging ideas. And his new book, uh, which is I was lucky enough to get a copy of, The, the Good Ancestor, uh, talks about uh, how to be a good ancestor and talks about um, how in, in today in an age of uh, driven by the tyranny of 24-7 news, the latest tweets, by now and, and very much short-termist um, views, how can we step into the future and start to consider those people that we will never have a chance to ever meet and think about how we can help to build the, the best world and the best conditions for those for them to thrive in. Um, and so we're going to have a, a good sort of 20, 25 minutes where Roman's going to talk through some of some of that process, uh, give you a chance to get involved and hopefully be quite interactive. Um, and then we'll have a, a chance at the end to have some more questions from the audience and, and we'll go from there. So over to you, Roman. And Thank you very much for that introduction, Andy, and hello to everybody. Um, as Andy said, I want to share some thoughts with you from this new book of mine called The Good Ancestor, how to live, uh, think long term in a short term world. And the place I'd like to begin, if you can throw your minds back this far to before COVID-19, to the time of the last UK general election at the end of last year. And back then, my partner and I decided to give our 11-year-old twins an unusual birthday present. We decided to give them our votes. So we all sat around the kitchen table and we debated the various party manifestos and then they told us where to put the X on the ballot sheet. And well, in case you're wondering, they didn't exactly follow their parents' political opinions. Now, why do we do this? We did it because we live in an age of pathological short-termism where we largely ignore the interests of the generation upon generation of children who will inhabit the future. We know our politicians can barely see past the next election or even the latest tweet. Our businesses can't see past the next quarterly report. Markets spike and crash in speculative bubbles. Nations sit around international conference tables bickering away about their near-term interests while the planet burns and species disappear. And as individuals, of course, we're constantly sending the rapid fire text, buying fast food, pressing the buy now button. This is the age of the tyranny of the now. And we all know, I think instinctively that we need more long-term thinking. We need long-term thinking in the public health sphere. Those countries that had long-term pandemic plans in place like Taiwan have dealt with coronavirus much more effectively than those countries which haven't like the United States. We need it to tackle um, the intergenerational uh, impacts of racial injustice, which are embedded uh, in public institutions today and will stay embedded unless we transform our societies and cultures and those institutions. We need it to tackle technological risks that are just over the horizon, such as the risks from AI controlled lethal autonomous weapons. And of course, there are the threats from the ecological crisis, from climate change, from biodiversity loss, we need to wean ourselves off our short-term addiction to fossil fuels. And the way I think about um, this, I mean, in a way, there's a paradox here, which is that the need for long-term thinking is incredibly urgent, right? We need it right here, right now. And to step back and take a perspective of this, the way I look at this is that I believe that humankind, particularly in the wealthy countries of the global north, humankind has colonized the future. We see the future as like a distant colonial outpost where we can freely dump ecological degradation and technological risk and nuclear waste as if there was nobody there. And it's a bit like the way when Britain colonized Australia in the 18th and 19th century, they drew on a legal doctrine now known as terra nullius, nobody's land, which is the idea that there were no indigenous people in Australia. Um, but of course they were. And I think today we've uh, adopted as well, not tempus nullius, but something I think, not terra, terra nullius, but something I think of as tempus nullius. The, the future we see is um, one of nobody's time. It's similarly uh, a distant colonial outpost devoid of people. 
And just as there are still struggles to be had against the doctrine of terra nullius, so indigenous Australians fighting for land rights, for instance, there is a struggle to be had against the doctrine of tempus nullius. And the great tragedy of this situation, I think, is that future generations aren't really here to do much about the colonizing of their futures. They can't throw themselves in front of the king's horse like a suffragette or block an Alabama bridge like a civil rights protester or go on a salt march to defy their colonial oppressors like Mahatma Gandhi. And I think to grasp the scale of this tragedy, I just like to show you um, an image which I call the scale of unborn generations. You should be able to just see it there. And this has been developed by a great writer called Richard Fisher. And there in the little green circle is everyone who's alive today. That's 7.7 .7 billion of us. If we cast our minds back 50,000 years, an estimated 100 billion people have been born and died. But if we look forward 50,000 years, if this century's uh, birth rate um, levels off remains constant, nearly 7 trillion people will be born. So there in that giant orange circle are our future generations. These are you know, all our children and grandchildren, our nephews and nieces and all of their children. And you should be looking at my face again. I think I've clicked off sharing screens. And really there's a question there of how those future generations are going to judge us for what we did or didn't do when we had the chance. And someone who really thought about this issue a lot was the immunologist Jonas Salk. He was he and his team developed the polio vaccine back in 1955. And Salk thought that if we were going to become good ancestors, and he believed the great question of our time was, are we being good ancestors and how can we be good ancestors? He thought if we were going to be good ancestors and be remembered well by future generations, what we needed to do was to expand our time horizons. So instead of thinking on a scale of seconds and minutes and hours, we need to think on a scale of decades and centuries and millennia. And in many ways, there are inspiring projects around the world which are starting to do this. Think, for example, of the, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault in the Arctic Circle, where the world's plant biodiversity is being kept intact. They've collected over a million seeds from more than 6,000 species, which is being kept in an indestructible rock bunker that's designed to last for at least a thousand years. Or there's projects like the 10,000 year clock, which is a clock being built inside a limestone mountain in the Texas desert, which is designed to last for and stay accurate for 10 millennia. And you'll be able to hike there through the desert and go up steps cut into the side of the mountain to visit the clock. Each step is the equivalent of a million years of geological time. And it's kind of like a secular altarpiece to a long-term thinking civilization to get us to encourage us to think about the long-term consequences of our actions. Now, as I've been talking, you have probably been thinking of some of your own examples of long-term thinking and planning that inspire you. And what I'd love you to do for me is to just in, your, in the chat box there to write down, jot down an example or two of long-term thinking um, projects or plans that you have come across that you think are particularly interesting. They might be things from the cultural sphere, such as you know, Jem Finer's musical composition, Long Player, which is a, a 1,000 year long um, piece of music. It started playing on the last moments of 1999, and it's going to be playing until the last moments of 2099. Um, somebody there has, Paul's just mentioned the Future Library, Katie, Katie Patterson's art project, which I'm going to talk about um, in a moment. And I'm sure you've you know, got lots of other uh, examples which have been uh, popping um, into your head. And I hope we can come back to some of those as we uh, talk. Someone there's just written seed banks. There's a famous, some of you might know about the famous Vavilov Seed Bank founded in, in St. Petersburg in the 1920s, where when it was besieged by the Russians, uh, by the Germans in the Second World War, the people who were caring for the seeds locked themselves inside and starved to death they didn't even eat any of the seeds. They thought this was so precious. They wanted to preserve the Babylon Seed Bank for future generations. There's another example there from Elizabeth of time capsules. And there's some great art projects, which are uh, a time capsule kinds of projects. So yeah, as I said, hopefully we can come back to some of those. But what I'd love to do now um, to interrupt your thoughts slightly is talk about 
four different ways of cultivating long-term thinking. And these are a few of the things that I talk about in my book. Um, one of the, these four I'm going to talk about uh, has to do with our brains. I'm going to talk about our, our legacies, our capacity for uh, long-term um, for long-term planning, and our politics. Um, and let's start though with this: the human brain. So inside our minds, there is a constant tug of war going on between the drivers of short-term and long-term thinking. You know, do we party today or save for our pensions for tomorrow? Do we upgrade our phone to the latest uh, model or do we plant a seed in the ground for posterity? And the short-term drivers of our brain, well, well, let me show you what the short-term part of our brain looks like. It looks like this. I call it the marshmallow brain. And the marshmallow brain is the part of our neuroanatomy, very ancient, at least 80 million years old. We share it with rats and other mammals. The marshmallow brain is the bit which focuses on immediate rewards and instant gratification very deep part about how we operate. And it's called the marshmallow brain. I call it that named after the famous marshmallow test from the 1960s you may know about where marshmallow was placed on a table in front of children. And if they could resist eating it for 15 minutes, they were rewarded with a second marshmallow. And lo and behold, the majority of kids couldn't resist it and snatched it. But the thing about the marshmallow test is this, it is not the whole story of who we are because alongside our marshmallow brains, we also have this the acorn brain. This is another part of our neuroanatomy and we've all got one. And it lives here in the frontal lobe above the, at the top of your head, above the eyes, particularly in a part called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And that's the part of the brain, it's a new part of the brain, only a couple of million years old, that focuses on long-term thinking and planning and strategizing. And humans have this part of the brain particularly well developed. So of course, other animals do think long-term too. They do plan, but not as much as humans in general. So a chimpanzee might get a branch, uh, strip off the, the leaves and cre to create a tool to poke into a termite hole. But a chimpanzee will never make a dozen of these tools and set them aside for next week. But that is precisely what a human being will do. We are planners extraordinaire. You know, we will plan for our children's education. We will make a song list for our own funerals. This is the acorn brain in action. That's how we built the Great Wall of China and voyaged into space. So what I'd like to say here, my first point really is this, is that let's realize that we are not just short-term marshmallow snatchers, we are long-term acorn thinkers. We need to adopt a new narrative about who we are. We're short and long. We have an amazing ability to become part-time residents of the future. We need to use it. But then that brings me to my second point. How do we turn on our acorn brains? Well, that brings me to the topic of what's known as cathedral thinking, which is the idea of embarking on projects with very long time horizons of decades or even centuries. And it's named in honor of medieval cathedral builders um, who would, you know, build, uh, you know, embark on building a, you know, a church or it could have been a mosque in, a, in other parts of the world knowing that it would never be finished within their own lifetimes. And this cathedral thinking tends to come in very different forms. Um, you know, Greta Thunberg, of course, has talked about the importance of cathedral thinking to tackle uh, the climate crisis. And I'm just gonna show you um, another uh, image here. And there's an image of different kinds of cathedral thinking. So in the top left is an example, a classic example, that's Almminster from Southwest Germany. It was begun in 1377 when the residents of Ulm decided they wanted their own church. It wasn't finished for over 500 years until the year 1890. But apart from religious buildings of various kinds, there's also public works projects. On the right hand side, you can see the, the sewers of Victorian London built after the notorious Great Stink of 1858. Around that time in the years preceding that, tens of thousands of people would sometimes die due to cholera outbreaks because raw sewage was being pumped into the Thames, but in 1858, the stench was so bad in that hot summer that even MPs in the Houses of Parliament couldn't breathe. They had masks over their face, something we know about now. And they then passed this emergency legislation to build the sewers. And the guy who masterminded it was the chief engineer, Sir Joseph Bazalgette, who's standing on the top there on the right-hand side in the top hat. And with 22,000 workers over 18 years, 318 million bricks, they built the sewers. Um, which are still in use today. 
Um, it's an extraordinary long vision project. Basil Jet uh, and his workers realized that, you know, they needed to build the sewers twice as big if they were going to have a long term lifetime. And then in the bottom left hand corner, another form of cathedral thinking, by the way, that other form of the Basil Jet form of cathedral thinking, I sometimes think of the sewer thinking, but the bottom left hand corner is a reference to cathedral thinking in the form of long term social and political struggles of social movements, political movements. The suffragettes, for example, their first organization began in Manchester in 1867. They didn't achieve their aim of votes for women until uh, the late 1920s. And a lot of those political struggles are still going on. And in other realms, whether it's struggles for racial justice or struggles for indigenous rights, these are long term cathedral thinking struggles. And these are all, you know, in many ways, very inspiring um, examples. Um, but I think there is a danger of cathedral thinking because it can be put towards very narrow and self-serving ends. Just think, Adolf Hitler wanted to create an a thousand year Reich. That was cathedral thinking. Dictators like in North Korea want to preserve their power and privilege through the generations for their progeny. Or in the corporate world, uh, a former head of Goldman Sachs investment bank, Gus Levy, once said, we're greedy, but long term greedy, not short term greedy. Well, that's a very narrow kind of cathedral thinking that's not thinking about everyone in that big orange square uh, circle. And that's why we need to combine cathedral thinking with another issue, which is the question of the legacies that we leave, our personal legacies. And if we look back through human history, of course, we have inherited extraordinary legacies from the past, from those who planted the first seeds in Mesopotamia 10,000 years ago, who built the cities where we still live, who made the medical discoveries that many of us uh, can benefit from. But we've also inherited negative legacies from the past too. We've inherited colonial and slave era attitudes of racism and prejudice, which are built deep into our public institutions and criminal justice systems um, and into everyday culture and cultural relations. So we've got these different kinds of legacies and there's a question really hanging there, which is, well, what legacies do we want to pass on to the generations to come? And the good news about human beings is that, particularly once we reach middle age, we tend to think about leaving a legacy, something beyond our own lifetimes, keeping the fire of our own lives burning beyond death. But we tend to express our legacies in very different ways. So some people really focus on a egoistic form of legacy, wanting to be glorified, like a Russian oligarch who wants a wing of the National Gallery named after them. That's how they're going to stay alive forever. Most of us, of course, tend to focus on familial legacy, wanting to pass things on to children or grandchildren, whether it's um, you know, a, a house, private property, or it could be you know, passing on culture, religion, language, traditions. But I think if we're going to be good ancestors, we need to widen our sense of legacy to what I think of as a transcendent sense of legacy. That's about leaving gifts for the universal strangers of the future. And that's quite a task, isn't it? Because you know, particularly in Western culture, we tend to be highly individualistic. Our connections with future generations very far ahead aren't really very well developed. Unlike in some cultures, in you know, among some Iroquois uh, Native American people, for example, there's the idea you probably know of seventh generation thinking, making decisions based on the impact seven generations ahead, a kind of ethic of ecological stewardship. But how do we try and approximate that or, or get a feel for that today? Well, I'd like to give you a chance to do that through doing a very brief um, thought experiment, imaginative thought experiment with you called, I call it the great chain of life. It's inspired by um, some great long-term thinkers, I, uh, Ella Saltmarsh, um, who was speaking yesterday from the Long Time Project and some of her colleagues. And this is how it goes. What I'd like you to do for me just for a moment is to just close your eyes. And I'd like to, you to imagine for a moment a child who you really care about, a child in your life. It could be a nephew or niece or one of your own children. And just picture their face. And now, still with your eyes closed, I'd like you to imagine them 30 years in the future. Imagine again what they look like, what their joys are, what their struggles are, what's happening in the world around them. 
and now still with your eyes closed i'd like you to imagine them at their 90th birthday party picture their face picture the room they're surrounded by friends and family and old work colleagues and neighbors have a look out the window what's going on in that world around them and as they're standing there on their 90th birthday someone comes across to them and puts a tiny baby into their arms it's their first great grandchild and they look down at that baby into its eyes and they think to themselves what kind of future it will have and what will it need to survive and thrive in the years and decades ahead now if you just open your eyes again and consider that that tiny baby could well be alive far into the 22nd century. Their future isn't science fiction. It's an intimate family fact, just a couple of steps away from your own life. And I think, I mean, that can be a very confronting exercise. It can be very moving, especially if you've got a dark vision of the future. But I think certainly for me, when I do it, you know, I think what I see is that baby is not all alone, but it's part of a whole web of life, a web of human relationships, of community relationships, a web of life in the living world, the air that they breathe, the food that they eat. And I think if we care about that baby's life and wanting to leave a legacy for them, we need to care about not just their life, we need to care about all life, that whole set of relationships. And there's some wonderful projects, I think, which try to give us this larger transcendent sense of legacy and gift giving to future generations. Someone mentioned earlier, Paul Harris mentioned Katie Patterson's Future Library. If you don't know that, it's a 100 year art project which began in 2014. And every year for 100 years, a famous writer is leaving, donating a book, which will remain completely unread inside the Future Library until the year 2114, when the 100 books will be printed on paper made from a thousand trees which have been planted in a forest just outside Oslo. And so the first person to read, leave a book was Margaret Atwood, Elif Shafak, and others have given books to it. And just think that Margaret Atwood is never going to meet the readers of that book. She's going to be long dead. That's an extraordinary gift to the future. But we can also see this legacy gift giving in social activism. So, for example, the um, Kenyan medical professor Wangari Matai, who founded the Green Belt Movement in 1977, the first African woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize, she set up this project to empower women and to restore the living world. And between 1977 and her death in 2011, she trained up with her team over 25,000 women in agroforestry skills. More than 40 million trees were built, uh, were, were planted. And still today, um, they're working with the Greenbelt Movement with over 4,000 community groups uh, across Africa. And I can see someone there, Rob Short has mentioned, trees for life there's all sorts of fantastic legacy giving projects which are about long-term thinking but i certainly think wangari matai there it, her life was about a legacy gift to the future but that brings me now to my fourth and final point which is shifting from legacy and the personal in a way to the political because i deeply believe we need to reinvent political institutions for the long term we know that there is a chronic problem of political presentism in our political systems. I mean, I used to be a political scientist and apparently an expert in democratic government governance. And for a whole decade when I was doing that, it never once occurred to me that we systematically disenfranchise future generations in the way that women and slaves have systematically been disenfranchised through history. So what can we do about that? Well, the good news here is there are some moves being made towards redesign of political institutions. You may know that Wales has a future generations commissioner, Sophie Howe, who, who, whose job it is, is to scrutinize legislation for its impact on um, people 30 years from today. As she'll admit herself, she doesn't have enough power. She'd like more. There's a campaign right now for a future generations commissioner for the whole UK being introduced to parliament into the House of Lords by uh, John Bird, a member of the House of Lords, founder of the Big Issue magazine, and I urge you to support that campaign. It's called Today for Tomorrow, and that Future Generations Commission has got more power than the Welsh one. But one of the examples that I really like um, of democratic redesign, I'm just going to show you um, an image of it right now. Um, it's called Future Design, and it's a project in Japan, and you can see it up there on the screen now, and the way future design works 
is that it's a kind of citizen assembly model where local residents of towns and cities are invited to a city planning meeting and they are split into two groups. One group are told they're residents from the present day and the other group are told that they are residents from the year 2060. And they're given these almost sort of ceremonial green kimonos to wear to help them in this imaginative journey. And it turns out, of course, that the residents from 2060 come up with much more radical plans uh, for in environmental policy, education policy, across the board, uh, employment uh, issues than the, the current residents. So I really believe that if we are going to, you know, redesign our democratic institutions, we should be looking to models like future design, putting them into play in towns and progressive cities across the country in Britain and other places into local government. I'd also like to see the House of Lords um, abolished and replaced by a house of the future, which is based on a kind of citizen assembly model mixed with this future design movement that they've got in Japan. Um, so let me just sort of wind up now before we go to some questions and just say that here I've been talking about just four of many different ways we can start expanding our minds into the long now, into the long term. It's partly about switching on your acorn brain, about becoming a cathedral thinker, about expanding your transcendent legacy and redesigning political institutions. And, you know, here we are at a moment of extraordinary historical crisis and opportunity. I mean, the economist Milton Friedman, who admittedly I don't quote very often, once said, only a crisis, real or perceived, can create genuine change. And I think that's a pretty good historical rule of thumb. And, you know, if you look back, you know, at the Second World War, the crisis of the Second World War, out of that emerged pioneering long-term institutions such as the World Health Organization, um, the European Union, uh, the NHS, welfare states in many countries. And I think we need to be thinking um, just as radically about transformative long-term inst institutions to tackle our challenges today, whether it's climate threats or technological threats and other long-term um, risks and, and tasks that are, are facing us. And I believe that if we do that, if we make wise choices and long choices, we could well become the good ancestors that future generations deserve. And with that, I'd like to bring Andy back in and let us talk about it all. Thank you so much for that. It was really um, interesting to kind of um, to hear out loud the, the way you kind of talk through your thinking after reading the book and kind of uh, hearing some of your thought processes. So um, I think we'll keep an eye on, on the on the question line. So if anybody has any questions to drop in the chat, please do. And, and Yeah, please ask questions about whatever you like. I'd love to hear what your thoughts and questions are. Um, and I'll, I'll go first with a couple that I've just been writing down some notes for. Um, as that the line that you say around kind of um, leaving gifts gifts for the universal strangers of the future is uh, such a powerful kind of way of thinking into that kind of transcendental space space you talk about. I guess one of the things that um, I, I wonder how you kind of come across this challenge in, in a world where you kind of get driven into this uh, dichotomy of thinkers and doers and kind of almost. Um, a fetishization of the, the people who do the stuff are the, are the ones that are important rather than people thinking thinking big and thinking long. So how do you kind of help people to step outside the kind of what might feel like the ego driven nature of, of leaving like a legacy? How do you help people to think about it more in a, an empathetic or a more of a gift uh, kind of leaving a gift to that future? Yeah, that's a really fascinating question because I mean, you know, that phrase, the idea of the universal strangers, the future, I've sort of half stolen it from the um, sociologist Richard Titmus, who wrote a book called The Gift Relationship, which is about blood giving in the 1960s, how people would give blood voluntarily. How did that happen? And he talked that about there being a culture of caring for the universal stranger. And I think it's then another leap to the universal stranger of the future. How do we make that kind of leap? And and, and, and think about legacy in a non-egoistic way. It's very difficult. Um, certainly if I think about me, you know, I'm thinking about the legacy, I think about my children, of course. And that little thought experiment that uh, I did while I was speaking there was a way of trying to use our deep 
care about familial legacy as a bridge to a transcendent legacy. So to say, okay, wherever you are, rich or poor, different cultural backgrounds, whatever, most people, if you've got children or young people in your life, you care about their futures. And then that can become a bridge to something larger than that. Ultimately, though, I think there is a value in really engaging with other cultural traditions here, which have maintained strong legacy philosophies. So, for example, there's the Maori concept of Waka Papa, uh, which is spelt with a WH at the beginning. And Waka Papa is the Maori uh, concept of lineage or genealogy. And that's the idea that we are all in this great chain of life, stretching far into the past and long into the future. And it so happens that the light is shining here on this moment and the very now. And what we need to do is sort of shine the light more broadly. And I remember going to this amazing talk by a, a, a Maori uh, a legal children's activist called uh, Julia Vaiputi. And what she was saying, she said, she said, when I'm giving a talk, I feel that it's not just me here. It's the living and the dead and the unborn are all here in the room with me. And if we can somehow grasp a bit of that, though it's challenging, I think we're getting towards a more selfless form of legacy. It's interesting when you, you talk of the, the kind of the marshmallow brain and, and the acorn brain and um, the kind of the, the nature of human thinking, how we kind of switch between those different modes of thinking, depending on kind of what's in front of us as well. And, and sometimes you need that quick reaction and sometimes you need to, to think longer. So um, as a, a question in the line, which I guess is uh, something along that kind of lines in, around that, uh, don't you think the legacy gift giving might be easier to do for people that live in the first world countries compared to those living in third world countries? And how do you kind of uh, challenge, come across those those kind of paradoxes, which you also get in the kind of uh, environmental movement around sort of asking the poorest to do the most work and things like that? So I think there's a, a real issue to think about, which is the kind of uh, political economy and the cultural um, structures and power structures around the idea of long-term thinking and, and legacy. Um, and we need to engage with that. What's So on one level, of course, those people who are engaged in trying to meet their immediate needs are focused on the now. Um, very understandably, there are 230 million refugees and migrants in the world. And of course, they're focusing on the now, just like my father, who was a refugee from uh, Poland to Australia after the Second World War, when he arrived in Australia, he was dealing with racism, he was dealing with um, you know, housing shortages and employment issues and so on, focused on the now. But the curious thing is about this, I think this is really fascinating. It, as the way I see it is that those from more privileged positions actually tend to do less long-term legacy thinking than those from um, more oppressed parts of society or parts of the world. So an aristocrat might think about their legacy, but they're thinking about, passing on their land and their manor house just to their children, but nothing much more wider than that. But look at the other side of it. You know, actually, it is people who are of marginalized peoples who are really concerned about legacies and intergenerational justice. I mean, I gave the example there of the of Maori culture, you know, hard, hardly a privileged part of society in New Zealand, where they are deeply immersed in legacy giving. It's a deep cultural tradition and it comes out in their struggles for land rights and education rights in all sorts of areas. We see it in Native American culture, like in the you know, um, you know, Iroquois that I mentioned in the idea of seventh generation thinking. And of course, we see it in parts of the Black Lives Matters movement. If you think of Leila Saad's book, um, Me and White Supremacy. On the first page, she talks there about being a good ancestor. And it's a recognition, I think, that the legacy that these are not just struggles today, these are long term intergenerational struggles that the racial injustice is not now it's embedded in the deep past and it will remain embedded into the deep future unless there is serious radical action around that. So I think it's kind of inspiring that often that it's those who don't maybe not have the socioeconomic means who are absolutely engaged in intergenerational justice struggles. They are some of the leading time rebels of our age. And thinking on that um, a bit more in terms of uh, how um, I think you talk about kind of linking arms with 
with generations of the past, but also linking arms with, with the generations of the future. Um, do you think there's kind of almost this um, this discomfort and perhaps guilt that people almost don't want to connect themselves too much, whether that's to the past or to, or to the future in, in the way that they think in terms of very vocally a lot of people talking about um, British Empire's role in, in slavery and how very quickly people want to make themselves feel more comfortable with the story of the empire rather than maybe recognise some of the atrocities that it, that it forced upon uh, people. And do you think that that similar kind of uh, lack of willingness to sit in the discomfort goes extends into the future as well? That's really interesting. I think certainly that there is that issue of discomfort of sitting with the past. And of course, along with that comes a lot of psychological denial. And it's a it can be a long struggle to come out of that. I mean, I felt it literally myself about 10 days ago where I live in Oxford and I was on the streets in a protest to help bring down the Cecil Rhodes um, statue outside Oriel College on the high street, which is a there's been a bit of a victory there. And I was thinking how I was a student at that university 25 years ago. Um, and I used to go and read. Uh, well, A, I used to do have classes in tutorials in Oriel College. So I was a beneficiary of that colonial heritage and of all the money that came from Cecil Rhodes and the De Beers Mining Corporation and the apartheid system, which he helped orchestrate. And about 200 meters away from me on the other side was the library of All Souls College, the Codrington Library. Library. Well, Codrington was a famous slave owner. You know, they, they owned slaves in the Caribbean. So there's a lot of discomfort to sit with there. I think also there's a lot of discomfort coming our way in the future. I mean, we are facing a an era which has been called by Philip Alston, who's the UN Special Rapporteur on um, Human Rights and Extreme Poverty, an era of coming climate apartheid. You know, he talked about how in Hurricane Sandy in New York, for example, in 2012, there are around half a million people of, you know, African-American people from the poorest parts of New York who are left without water and electricity and healthcare, And yet around Goldman Sachs, again, there were sandbags and they had their own generators and they were fine. And there's a question then of someone like me, for example, you know, am I going to be helping to create that world or participant in a world of climate apartheid on which side of the wall am I going to be, you know, and that raises, you know, issues. Okay. Do I, I'm Australian. Do I fly to visit my father in Australia? Who's 87 years old. Um, I do that very rarely now because I give myself a carbon budget, but that's some of the uncomfortable stuff I, I live with and, and, and I'm trying to walk with and talk with. I think there's another question that's just come in from uh, Belinda as well. It's um, saying, is is thinking to the future more accessible uh, in cultures where people have a sense of what comes after our lives in a, in a religious sense? Right. So there's a question there about religion um, and its relationship to long term thinking. Thanks, Belinda. It's really interesting. I mean, on the face of it, one might think, OK, if you're from a religion that has a conception of an afterlife, an eternal heaven, an eternal paradise that might take you, make you more of a, a long-term thinker. When I've looked into the evidence for this, it's not clear that those people from religions that have that kind of idea of an eternal, um, you know, future or paradise are any more engaged in long-term thinking here in this world on this earth. Um, I think you do see it, for example, with people from Buddhist cultures with Buddhist backgrounds, where there's ideas, for example, of interbeing and interconnectedness, which runs through across space as well as through time and ideas of reincarnation can connect people more to the future. But thinking specifically of, you know, Western religion, for example, Christianity is really fascinating. Um, you know, when medieval Christianity kind of boomed, it split, it absolutely destroyed in many ways cyclical conceptions of time embedded in the living world. So suddenly you had this idea that there was a beginning when God created earth, then there was a, uh, a sort of a middle when Jesus was born, and then there's going to be a second coming. Cyclical ecological time got replaced with notions of linear time, the arrow of time from going from the past through the present and into the future. And in a way, I think we've lost our sense of connection with the ecological choreography of the planet those longer cycles, whether it's the cycles of the seasons or of the years or of the carbon cycle, the planets, the stars. And I think if we can get a bit more in touch with that, we're going to be getting back to um, 
a sort of a pre-organized religion kind of connection with a different mode of time, which can help us think into the longer now. I think um, what I was, I was interested to see how uh, you you feel the um, the way in which you kind of the political economy needs to shift for this this long term thing in terms of if we have a, a politics which is driven very much by social media and and who tweets what and, and things like that and um, and how do you help to I guess it's almost one of those sort of what comes first kind of things in terms of how do you get politicians to to talk about the long term and and how do you get electorates to want to think about the long term is is it is there one that needs to come first or is there sort of a an acceptance that, that it can happen at the same time so actually in a couple of weeks time i've got to do a briefing for mps about long-term thinking for that there's an all-party parliamentary group on future generations so i've i've been thinking about this question actually um because partly on one level there's you know, of course, politicians who are already in power or already engaged and trapped by the power structures in which they have arisen. Um, so it's very hard to get a cabinet minister to go up to them and say, you know, you ought to be thinking 100 years from now or 500 years from now. Um, but I think there are things that we can do. I think it's worth pushing for this future generations commissioner for the UK as a stepping stone, not as a solution to everything. I think there are more technical stuff one can be doing in, in the state. For example, there's this something known as discounting, which is a, a methodology, economic methodology used to where governments use it to work out whether they should invest in long term projects, infrastructure projects, hospitals or a tidal power scheme or something like that. And the way discounting works, basically the way the maths work is that the further you are away in, just like somebody, the further they are away from you in your vision, the smaller they are. Well, in discounting, the further they are away from you in time, the less value we give to them. So basically any project like a tidal power project, like the one they had in Swansea Bay, they were working on a couple of years ago, any benefits that come after 50 years are discounted away into nothing. And that can change. On the other side, you know, I've, I don't have a lot of faith in the political system. I have much more faith in citizen mobilization. I mean, just look at the incredible grassroots activity that's happened in under, you know, because of coronavirus, whether it's my streets, WhatsApp groups, other mutual aid support groups booming around the world in high income and low income countries. I think from those kinds of organizations, we're only a few steps away to something like the future design, the Japanese model that I talked about. So we need to, in a way, build on that kind of stuff we need to build on the energy around for example extinction rebellion and citizens assemblies that was coming up before COVID-19 and use that to create grassroots democratic transformation because I think that's ultimately we're going to have to that's where we're going to win the most important battles for um, political redesign political change. Great. That makes me think of um, a quote that I got from one of your pieces around um, is it Gustav uh land down around um the state is not something that can be destroyed but a revolution by a revolution sorry it's a a condition and a, and a relationship that we uh we mold by by our own behavior and we can destroy that state by contracting other relationships and i, I, I think that's fascinating and, and you kind of touch on that towards the end of the book as well around how um there's often this notion of, of individual versus kind of communal action and um, and how the, the two are, are nested together rather than different ends of, of the action scale, I suppose. Um, and the kind of when you talk about the actions that have the most potential to be amplified and, and as people, could you just explain that a bit more and then the kind of research you found on that? Yeah, so in fact, actually right next to me here, the, the place I first found that Gustav Landau quote was in this amazing book, Anarchy in Action by the great British anarchist Colin Ward, um, he put me onto Landau. And that idea that to think about the state as a set of relationships, uh, human relationships that we can reinvent, right? That's where our power lies. And what I've learned over time, I guess, or when my own thinking's finished, is to think about not just the relationships across space, but through time, right? Making those relationships with future generations. It's incredibly hard. I'm not saying any of this is easy. So, for example, I, 
I founded a museum called the Empathy Museum. It's run by a brilliant artist called Claire Patey and her team. And uh, some of you may have gone to it. It's a gigantic, one of her artworks is called A Mile in My Shoes. It's a gigantic shoe box which travels around the country, around the world. You can go inside and you can, you literally can be given a pair of shoes belonging to a stranger. It could be someone who's been in Wandsworth prison for 14 years or a Syrian asylum seeker or a Brazilian sex worker. And you can literally walk a mile in their actual shoes while listening to an audio narrative of them talking about their life. It's very intimate. It's very powerful. And I can just see slightly out of the corner of my eye in the chat box, someone mentioned oral history. Well, this is a kind of audio based oral history project. But one of the things about A Mile in My Shoes, that project is, well, how do we do that for future people? How do we make those connections? Um, but I certainly do believe that we can undertake actions which can be amplified. I mean, the classic one I mentioned at the end of my book is, you know, 50% of people who know somebody who's given up flying because of climate change fly less as a result themselves. So that's an individual action, but which has a contagion effect. But I also think we need to also engage in, you know, classic collective action here. This is an urgent issue. Individual actions, um, especially if they're not amplified, are not going to do it in time, not going to do it fast enough. So that's why we need to work on these multiple fronts. And I think this is Indy Johar was speaking about this kind of thing earlier today when talking about the complexities of trying to change a system. You might be need, needing to work in 40 different places at the same time. So you need things like Our Children's Trust, which is a, a legal campaign in the US to give rights for future generations to cut subsidies for fossil fuels. You need, you know, books like, you know, um, Leila Saad's Me and White Supremacy, which is about intergenerational injustice and challenging that and all the movements which come out of that. We need to be fighting in these and struggling in these multiple areas and bringing the time rebels together to connect them, to make them realize they are part of one movement in a sense, which has not yet been named. It doesn't yet exist, but there's a lot of people working on expanding their minds and their communities and their practices into a longer future. And I believe that they are the time rebels we need. Fantastic. I think that's a pretty good name for them, the uh, Time Rebels. And <laughs> I'm just going to try and uh, scan through a couple more of these questions that we've got coming in here. For uh, So um, from Jen Scott, we've got, um, in, in addition to thought experiments, uh, are there examples of embodied or somatic practices that you think would help us to understand or feel or live out the idea of being good ancestors? And I suppose that's a bit similar to the, the kind of uh, the empathy that you were talking about there. And, and, and what sort of role does this things like sci-fi and, and kind of futurist writing have in this? Is is there a way in which art can, can play a role in that? Yeah. Um, so I'm just reaching over to another book off my shelf here to answer that question, Pali. I mean, in terms of embodied experiences, I think there's lots of different ways of working with this. Some people may have been part of Ella Saltmarch's um, long time project um, and, and with her, her, her colleague B's thing yesterday which was about a deep dive into legacy connection inspired by um, Joanna Macy and the work that reconnects, which somebody mentioned there in the, in the chat. I think there's everyday things we can do, like going on a pilgrimage to an ancient tree once a month, visit a tree which is a thousand years old. And as the great Zen monk Thich Nhat Hanh said, when you go under that tree, don't just do something, sit there. You know, Don't take a photo of yourself, try to connect with its different timescape. The, the novelist Richard Powers talks about living life at the speed of tr speed of wood. Um, I think we can find ways of getting in touch with that in, in many different aspects of life. The question about sci-fi, um, look here I'm holding up a book, Kim Stanley Robinson's Aurora, which is a classic long-term thinking book. And this is basically, if you want to understand ecological economics, read this book. It's about how do People survive over multiple generations in a spaceship, keeping their biosphere intact without using more resources they can regenerate, without creating more waste than they can absorb. It is brilliant. If you if you find reading Herman Daly's books on ecological diff economics difficult, read Aurora or read something like Octavia Butler's classic book, The Parable of the Seed, you know, which is about a, a dystopian future written in the early 90s, set in 2025, it is challenging in terms of its depiction of class and race and the kind of futures we're going to inherit. So I believe absolutely that 
uh, fiction, art, theatre can be essential in the imaginative journeys into the future we need to take. By the way, that you're proving that that's not just a picture of a bookshelf behind you to <laughs> yeah. bring things down. No, I didn't just download this one, <laughs> but uh, I've been slowly collecting these books for 25 years just for this moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you, this is a question from Sarah Holiday, uh, do you think it's more important to create or plan for a certain type of future that we believe is right and just, or to create a future where future generations have the opportunities to choose for themselves? Or more that's important, really, that they have the same opportunities that we do now? That's a really interesting question. I probably need more time to think about that. Let me tell you what just comes to my mind first. And then the one thing, the, one of the most important things here to recognize is that there are multiple futures and we need to recognize that different parts of society have different vis um, visions of what they want their future to be. So we need to have a plurality of futures. And that's why, um, for example, I think that the idea of having a, a future generations commissioner might be a good idea, but there's a sort of lat there's a, a need to be injected with more democratic legitimacy. That's why you need to connect it with citizen assembly models so you can have the multiplicity of visions of the future um, become part of our conversations about what we think the year 2100 should be like or what people in those times need. At the same time, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, what's the point of thinking about the future? There may not even be human beings around and they might be, we might be living in a world of cyborgs with totally different views of different values, you know, different senses of well-being. Well, I think actually the chances are that at least for the next few hundred years, there are going to be beings around either just like us or pretty close to us who will do a lot of the same things. They will fall in love. They will get stressed and panic. They will be thinking about purpose. And if there are those beings around, then we know what kind of world that they need. We know they need to breathe the air around them. We know that they we need to live within the bio capacity of the one and only planet that we know s sustains life rather than jetting off to Mars, like Elon Musk says. You know, he says, I want to die on Mars, but not on impact. Well, you know, I, the way, one of the ways I think about this is that you know, if you're a mountain climber, you know, before you go up a, 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 a tricky peak, you make sure your base camp is in order first. And I think, you know, we haven't got the base camp of this planet in order yet. We use 1.6 planets per year in terms of our ecological footprint. Um, it's only going up. It's gone down slightly, actually, because of COVID-19, latest uh, data on that. But it's going, you know, it's basically projecting upwards. And so we know that there's something that we share with future generations about um, ecological integrity. We know we're connected there. So in, on that level, we know what to do. And it's partly it's about not just thinking about time, but about place, falling in love with this place, you know, with the ash trees I can see outside the garden there and beyond. I think it's interesting just almost linking together some of the, the sessions we've, we've had throughout the day in terms of um, Margaret Heffernan was talking about this kind of plurality of futures and how um, all too often we're trying to to grasp onto what the future will be like rather than kind of think about what are the, the possible ways and that uncertainty will unravel. And um, do you think that kind of um, the kind of lack of clarity of the future gets in the way of people sort of committing themselves to be long term thinkers? Ah, OK. I tell, let me tell me what I think about this. Um, I think that the idea that we don't know that the future is uncertain has a danger of becoming a political ideology which encourages apathy and inaction. The idea, oh my God, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, so let's not plan for it. Well, we know a lot about what's going to happen in the future because we're pumping carbon into the atmosphere that's going to be around for 200 years, 500 years. Look at the IPCC projections. Some of them are for sea level rises going 500 years in the future. We don't know exactly how it's going to hit and exactly who's going to be hit, how much, how fast but we know that future is coming. So I think in many ways, there's a lot more certainty around than we think. So I, I think we shouldn't go into a cul-de-sac of um, thinking, oh my God, the world is only full of these sort of horrendous butterfly effects and we can't uh, prepare ourselves for anything. But on the other hand, we know that we are living in an age of emergencies and more and more emergencies. There are going to be emergencies around the, you know, the power embedded in our, you know, police systems and judicial systems that have been sparked off recently. 
There are going to be emergencies around uh, genetically engineered pandemics. Um, going to be emergencies around food insecurity and nutrition insecurity. Um, all those things are coming our way, and we need to build systems of resilience for that. We don't know exactly what they are, but we know we have to prepare for them. In a way, we've got to be like Basil Jett and his Victorian sewers, right? Making the sewers twice as big as they need to be um, and investing in that, not doing things like it's been done to the NHS, which is cutting it down to the bare bones so it has no resilience. So when an epidemic comes along, it cannot adjust. There's no flexibility, adaptability in that system. Yeah, there's no able to, to cope with the just in case scenario and, and, and what's there to, to work on. But uh, I think we've just got a couple more minutes left. Um, so I'm going to just quickly see if there's any other questions popped up. By the way, really great questions from people, really fascinating. Yes. And if you. I don't answer all of them, I haven't answered all of them, I'm happy to try and answer them in, in Twitter as well or somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> somewhere like, go to my Twitter account. Uh, okay, I think that's good. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you very much, Vera. Uh, it's been wonderful to talk to you this evening. Um, really fascinating book, and, and I'll just urge everyone to go out. It's out next month, is it? Early July? Yeah, it's out in a few weeks' time. Yeah. yeah so um, please do uh, look up Roman on Twitter and also on, on your website as well, that's got a kind of collection of some of the, the other writing as well and things like that. And, uh, just want to say a massive thank you for, for sharing this evening with us. Well, and, thank um, you to you, Andy, and thank you to everyone for your thoughts and questions and contributions. And again, sorry I didn't manage to talk about um, all of it, but um, it's given me lots of food for thought. So thank you. Okay, well, and thank you everyone for, for joining us this evening and hope you've enjoyed this day of, uh, of program. Um, and we'll hopefully see you again tomorrow for some more uh, mind bending and mind expansion. So thank you very much. Thank you.